if there's one kind of deck I adore in Magic the Gathering, aside from dungeons and aristocrats, it's Landfall. It's such a good, straightforward strategy that rewards players of any skill level with a great payoff for doing a game action that they should be doing as often as possible anyway. For those who don't know, Landfall says anytime a land enters the battlefield under your control, you get some type of triggered effect off of that. And Wizards of the Coast is historically a bit hit or miss with their landfall decks. Uh, I've learned that even some of my favorite commanders, like AC, his deck was uh, kind of only okay. The Obun deck was also kind of only okay. These decks were built during the earlier stages of the current format of commander design, so I understand that those decks may have not been designed with the same level of care that current decks are, but even the Yuma deck that came out recently needs a little more oomph to get in there. It's a pretty strong deck when you're playing a battlecruiser style game and people aren't interacting with you much, but the deck really does kind of suffer from uh, dirtling with a lot of things to do and then not closing out a game. We're going to see if we can't help it do that while also giving it a little more backbone so that it can fight back and fixing one of the shortcomings that the precon actually had with the deck as well. Speaking of that precon, uh, the precon commander we are looking at is Yuma Proud Protector, legendary creature that costs one less for every land in your graveyard, which does count towards his hefty eight mana cost com uh, commander tax as well. So whenever he dies and would normally cost 10 mana, we're just going to drop him by one more every time. That's fine. Uh, whenever he enters a battlefield or attacks, you can sack a land to draw a card, which is also really good. It reminds me of Lord Windgrace. And when a desert is put into a graveyard, from anywhere, create a 4-2 green plant warrior creature token with reach. These are all really, really good abilities, but the deck has two other possible commander options that we need to consider. The first is actually shown in the artwork of the commander himself, Kiri Talented Sprout, and he shows the other half of the deck's design. Now, for those who don't know, whenever Wizards of the Coast makes a commander deck, they typically build two 50% uh, of decks, basically, and shove them together. Sometimes the two halves of these decks co-mingle really well, sometimes they don't. In this case, they do actually co-mingle fairly okay. While one of our commanders is a landfall commander who benefits from putting lands into the graveyard, Kiri Talented Sprout benefits from us having lands in the graveyard by being able to put them back into our hand. He also could give us plants and tree folks to our hand as well if we have used them up. And this deck boasts at least a few of those in it. There are three plants in the deck, and as far as tree folks are concerned, the deck has, um... Oh, that's interesting. Uh, well, it has none. Well, if we don't have any tree folk to work with, then there's only so much that the commander is going to be able to grab if we choose Kiri. So let's go with Yuma, the Proud Protector. He gets supplemented plenty well from Kiri being in the 99. And honestly, a lot of the initial deck is geared towards him to begin with. It's not really geared towards plant tokens that much. So let's go ahead and try to get this deck tuned up a bit more. But first, we have to figure out where we are starting. So let's get into that. So right out of the box, we are looking at what Yuma's got going on, and we've got three board wipes, one big desert synergy piece, three pieces of draw and card advantage, five pieces that can let us go into the graveyard and throw lands there. We've got five pieces that can take lands out of the graveyard. We've got one piece of protection for the commander, 11 pieces of ramp, eight pieces of recursion, eight pieces of removal and interaction six token producers, one surprise win con, and then about 40 different lands, 15 of which are deserts, and three of which are their own respective dual lands, with three different ways to fetch lands and two lands that can tap for anything that the deck wants otherwise. Now, these are some pretty good numbers to start out with, but there are a couple things I want to change, and let's go ahead and get into how the deck is built right now so we can figure out what we are doing to change things. Now, the way the deck is currently built, starting from the top, we've got Cataclysmic Prospecting as one of our board wipes. This deals X damage to each creature. 
for each mana that was spent from a desert, we can also create a tap treasure token. This is an interesting way to wipe the board, but still a bit expensive. Descend upon the Sinfill. Uh, this can go ahead and exile all creatures, and then it gives us a 4-4 white angel as a replacement. Not the best way to do asymmetric board wipe, but it is at least a way that keeps us uh, in the game. And then Heaven and Earth deals X damage to each creature with flying, then X damage to each creature without flying. I, um... I hate this card. I don't like this at all. In the this is this is probably getting cut. Uh, then in the desert synergies, this is our Dune Chanter. Lands we control and lands we don't uh, have, but are nonetheless ones we own are all deserts in addition to their other types. And lands you control can tap for one mana of any color. Basically, this is a chromatic lantern while also giving us other upsides for our deserts. As for draw, we've got Bitter Reunion. This gives all of our creatures haste if we sack it, but also it's a thrill of possibility otherwise. Discard a card, draw two cards. Electric Revolution is another thrill of possibility like, but it has flashback. Magnetic Insight is the same, but it costs one less and we discard a land only for its effect. Embrace the Unknown, exiles the top two cards of our library, and then we are able to play them until the end of our next turn. A basic impulse draw with Retrace that lets us discard lands in order to use it over and over again. Honestly, pretty decent card. Then we have Escape the Wilds, exile the top five cards of our library. We can play lands exiled this way until our next turn, and then we also get to play an additional land this turn. It's a bit expensive at five mana, but you are getting five cards of card draw. One mana per card draw, plus the extra land you get to drop on the board it's pretty decent return of the wild speaker is uh two cards in one either we draw cards equal to the greatest power among non-humans we control or non-humans we control get plus three plus three until end of turn at instant speed this is either the best draw spell in the deck or it is the win con in the deck you take your pick nantuko cultivator is an interesting wheel enters the battlefield you may discard a card uh and any number of land cards sorry put that many one one counters on an Antuko cultivator then draw that many cards and then we have thrilling discovery two mana it's in boros colors gain two life discard two cards draw three cards satyr wayfinder enters the battlefield return the top four cards of your library or reveal the top four cards of your library put a land card from among them into your hand the rest into the graveyard and then genesis hydra pay two and an x uh, reveal the top x cards from your library and then choose one of them and basically play it for free and then give the genesis uh, hydra a bunch of one one counters honestly the, the the draw package in here really wants some work in terms of cards that give us uh, advantage in various ways. But let's move on to the next section, uh, and we will do our cuts here in a bit. The next section we have is the stuff that puts stuff in the graveyard. Crawling Sensation, at the beginning of your upkeep, mill two, when one land uh, is put into the graveyard from anywhere each turn, create a 1-1 one, one green insect token that first time. Eccentric Farmer, ETB, mill three, then return a land from your graveyard to your hand. Perpetual Timepiece lets us mill two cards repeatedly, and then we can use it to reset at our graveyard. Uh, win winding Way, choose a creature or land, remove the top four of our library, put all cards of the chosen type into our hand and the rest into the graveyard. And then World Shaper, whenever it attacks, we can mill three cards, and if it dies, return all lands from our graveyard to the battlefield tapped. A splendid reclamation style effect. Next, we have cards that put lands from our graveyard into either our hand or the battlefield. Ramanuk, Excavator, Perennial Behemoth, and Ancient Green Warden can all let us play lands from the graveyard with ancient green warden having the added ability to double up on our triggers when landfall stuff happens scare tiller says every time it becomes tapped put a land from our hand from our uh, hand for onto the battlefield tapped or put a land from our graveyard onto the battlefield tapped and then uh, Hazazon Shaper of Sand says you can play deserts from your graveyard if a desert you control enters the battlefield make two one one sand warrior creature tokens more token production while doing other stuff this guy could be a secondary commander for the deck if we so chose he's great the one protection piece we have is a solitary Swiftfoot Boots. And then in the ramp section, Explorer draws us a card and lets us plant additional land. Elvish Rejuvenator which reveals the top five cards of our library and lets us drop a land out. Chromatic Lantern is an Omni Mana Rock that lets all of our lands tap for any color. Uh, Arcane Signet's an Omni Mana Rock for two. Soul Ring taps for two mana. You know it and you're used to it by now, I hope. Sand Scout lets us put a desert onto the battlefield if somebody has more lands than us. And if one or more lands are put into a graveyard from 
anywhere, make a 1-1 red, green, and white sand warrior creature token once per turn. Harrow lets us sacrifice lands to get two basics from the deck. Hour of Promise lets us get two deserts from the deck, any, well, any land card at all, and then gives us two black zombie creature tokens map the frontier lets us get two deserts or any other uh basic lands out of the deck oracle of moldaya lets us look at the top card of our library and play an additional land each turn and play lands from the top of our library and spring bloom druid is another version of haro sack of land put two basic lands onto the battlefield tapped and then shuffle then with Recursion, with eight cards strong, we have Vengeful Regrowth. Take three lands from our graveyard, put them all on the battlefield tap, make that many plant on, uh, plant tokens. Also, we get to flashback if we need it. Savine's Reclamation, put any permanent with mana value three or less, like a land on the uh, battlefield, or we can flash it back later and get two copies of Savine's Reclamation. Marshall's Anthem gives all of our creatures 1-1, one, one, and with its multi-kicker, we can put X target creature cards from our graveyard onto the battlefield, uh, where X is the amount of times that we multi-kicked it. Mending of Dominaria, mill two cards, put a creature from our graveyard to our hand, and then also put all lands from our battle uh, graveyard onto the battlefield once it hits three points on it. And then we also shuffle our graveyard into our library. Sun Titan reanimates anything, mana value three or less every time it ETBs or swings. Kiri gets uh, a plant tree folk or land from our graveyard to our hand while also giving all of our plants and tree folks to O. Oh, Angel of Indemnity. Uh, when it enters the battlefield, return a permanent mana value four or less from our graveyard to the battlefield. And it's got Encore so we can exile it and get a token copy of it on the battlefield as well. And then Skullwinder, when it enters the battlefield, return a card from our graveyard to our hand, and then choose an opponent. That player returns any card from their graveyard to their hand. A politics piece in a landfall deck. Interesting card choice. Then in the removal and interaction, we're a little bit lean with eight in the main deck. Wreck and Rebuild blows up an artifact or enchantment or gives us a mill five and ramp. Path to Exile exiles a creature and then turns it into a piece of mana. Decimate can blow up an artifact, creature, enchantment, and land you have to choose all of them as you play it. Valorous Stance, uh, give a creature indestructible or blow up a creature with toughness four or greater. Um, yeah, I don't know what this one's doing in here. Unholy Heat can deal six damage to a creature or Planeswalker. Uh, another interesting choice. Bovine Intervention, destroy an artifact or creature, give somebody a 2-2 Ox. Angel of the Ruins can plane cycle, while also exiling to artifacts or enchantments. And uh, Requisition Raid, Destroy an artifact, destroy an enchantment, or uh, put a 1-1 counter on each creature a player controls, or do all of them, because it's a spree card. And then the main win con of the deck, like I said, we are looking at tokens. Scoot Swarm makes copies of itself every time we play lands, as long as we have six or more to begin with. Omnath makes five, five elementals every time we play a land. Nestle Dragon makes uh, little dragon egg tokens, and if they die, they make two, two dragon tokens with fire breathing. Avenger of Zendikar makes 01 plants, and then with landfall, we put a 1-1 counter on every plant we control. Turn Timber Sower makes plants every time a land is put into our graveyard from anywhere, but note it's only once per time we do it, not once per land. We can also sack three creatures to take a land from our graveyard and put it into our hand. And then we have Titania, Protector of Argoth. Whenever a land we control is put into a graveyard from anywhere, create a 5-3 green elemental creature token. And when this ETBs return a land from our graveyard to the back battlefield and of course the last thing is the win con as rumbleweed sits here as a 11 mana card that costs one less for every land in our grave and it gives all of our other creatures three three and trample so that is the entirety of the deck it's got a land package as well but honestly uh the only thing to note is that 15 of them are in fact deserts and we have yet another reprint of the sun scorch divide in here for people who need that so let's go ahead and talk about what we are going to be doing to this deck and why first let's talk about cards that are leaving <laughs> Now, we are going to be making 25 cuts to this deck, freeing up a quarter of the space for some other things, and we also want to increase the land count in the deck. It is a dedicated landfall deck, so even though it has 40 lands in a dedicated landfall deck, I like having closer to 44 or 45. 
So let's start out with, we're getting rid of every board wipe in this deck. Each one of these board wipes is overcosted for what it's doing. So we are gonna go ahead and cut them all out. In the draw an advantage section, Genesis Hydra doesn't give us a whole lot of advantage. So it's getting cut. Seder Wayfinder is okay at best, but it whiffs decently often. And we can get better bang for our buck in terms of amount of draw. And the Nantuko Cultivator, I'm gonna be honest, I would rather just any other actual wheel card that lets us go through our deck quicker. As for our Into the Graveyard stuff, uh, the World Shaper, Eccentric Farmer, Crawling Sensation, Perpetual Timepiece, and Winding Way are all leaving. We are going to be focusing on different ways to get lands in the graveyard than the ones that originally came in the deck. We're also cutting Scare Tiller from the cards that gave us lands in the graveyard. We are also cutting Explore and Chromatic Lantern from our ramp section. Chromatic Lantern, I feel, does not do enough to justify its spot in this deck. It is a three mana deck that is very green heavy, so it is fairly easy for the deck to get its colors on its own. Dropping three mana on a rock, I don't think it's that necessary. We could use better mana rocks in this place or just better ramp pieces. In the recursion section, Angel of Indemnity is leaving. There's a better Angel for Landfall decks we're going to be playing instead. Savine's Reclamation is leaving as good as this card is. I think there is a more recurrable card we are going to be using in its place. Vengeful Regrowth just doesn't do enough for the six mana it's asking. And Skullwinder is more of a political piece than anything. I don't really want to run this card in a deck like this because I don't want to give my opponent stuff to begin with. Not in a deck that it's not trying to politic. Uh, in the token section, we're getting rid of the Nesting Dragon. The tokens it gives us is, are just not impactful enough to matter. And we're going to get rid of the turn Timbo Sower. As good as sacking through creatures to get a land from our graveyard back to the battlefield, uh, back to our hand is and as good as putting a land from anywhere onto the battlefield is, there are some better, stronger options we are going to be putting in this place that are a little more explosive. When I was seeing the original version of this deck play, and when I've had it in my hands, cards like this feel like they're a really good piece of something bigger, but I would rather just have that something bigger to begin with. In the removal and interaction section, Unholy Heat and Valorous Stance are both going to be leaving. Uh, Valorous Stance, the Indestructible is okay, but it's not really that necessary. And that destroying a creature with toughness for or greater, we have better ways of doing that in white. The Unholy Heat, I'm sorry, but damage is not a reliable way to kill creatures all the time. I would rather have something that says destroy target creature or something that says exile or something that says minus minus. Uh, when it, we are looking at the weakest ways to remove creatures from a board, combat is at the very top of weakest ways and then straight up damage is second to that. Every other way to remove a creature is preferable as far as I am concerned because they can scale. Even fighting a creature can scale with a creature that's toughness ramps up, especially against, say, Voltron commanders. As far as Zul lands, we are going to be cutting the single filter land they gave us, not because it's not good, but because we want to make room for something else. And we are cutting the jungle shrine. This one is because it is, in fact, not good. Uh, I do not like a land that comes into play tapped and doesn't do anything for us if our deck doesn't need that mana desperately. I think that if you are running a try land in your deck, it is more understandable if the deck doesn't have green and therefore is less likely to have access to its colors. But we are a green deck, so we've got plenty of ways to get all the colors we possibly could want. We don't need this jungle shrine. Now, getting into the nitty gritty, the additions, the things we are going to be adding to the deck to improve its power and consistency. First off, this deck wants more deserts. 15 is a lot, but it is simply not enough. So we are going to be upping that desert count by five, and then we will be adding a little more ways to throw lands in the graveyard as well. So let's start out with the Arid Archway. This is basically Guildless Commons, but it is a desert, and if it enters the battlefield and we return a desert to our hand, we get to surveil one, which can also trigger our commander. This is fantastic. Why was it not included in the pre-con? Then we have Buckloic Ranch. Uh, it taps for a colorless mana, or it can tap for a mana of any color if we cast a mount spell, or we can pay three and tap it to look at the top card if it's a uh, mount. We put it into our hand and reveal it. If not, uh, we just put everything into the bottom of our library. 
This is in here solely because it is an extra desert. The effects on it do not matter. Cradle of the Accursed adds Cuddleless to our mana pool, and we can sacrifice it to make a zombie, which will trigger our commander making another 4-2 plant. Uh, we also have Grasping Dunes, which can sacrifice itself to put a neg-1, neg-1 counter on a creature at sorcery speed which also triggers our commander. That's the reason we're running these deserts, is to trigger our commander more. And then we have Survivor's Encampment, which can tap an untapped mana we uh, control, untapped creature we control, to add a mana of any color to our mana pool, or it can just give us colorless mana. Then we also have the ways we are going to be fetching more lands out of the deck. Myriad Landscape to get two basic lands from our deck. I don't know why this wasn't in the pre-con. It's usually in like every pre-con. And then we have Promising Vein and Escape Tunnel. Promising Vein can sack itself for a basic land and also it can come into play untapped. The Promising Vein comes into play untapped. Sorry, the land it gets will come into play tapped. So pick your poison on where you use this. And then Escape Tunnel is the third version of the Evolving Wild Terramorphic expand a uh, cr triumphant basically and then finally the reason we got rid of that filter land is to add in sacred peaks comes into the battlefield tapped but it is a mountain and a plains which is important because the deck came with the crows and verge and we want to make use of that crows and verge we want to be able to have access to those extra land types in the 99 of the deck so just have one of these available then, as far as board wipes are concerned, we want to go ahead and add some new ones in. A Blasphemous Act, dealing 13 damage to every creature effectively for one mana, is better than the mana sinking that every one of the other cards was asking of us. And Austere Command, if we're going to play a white removal board wipe for six, this is where I want to be instead. We can either blow up all artifacts, all enchantments, or all creatures with mana value three or less, or four or greater, and we pick two of those modes. This this can get us out of far more jams than that other uh, board wipe could, just exiling all creatures and giving us an angel. Then in the draw package, we're going to be upgrading ourselves by giving us a Brass's Tunnel Grinder, a true wheel that also says... If we have boar counters by throwing uh, creatures or any permanent into the graveyard, of course the deck wants to do that, it will flip into the Searing Rift, which can let us have every spell be cast with its mana uh, Discover X, where X is the mana value of that spell. A fantastic artifact. Camaraderie and Shamanic Revelation are both also drawing us uh, a card for every creature we control, which will synergize with our tokens very, very well. Next in the ramp section, we have Blossoming Tortoise. This card is fantastic in this deck, and it's such a great new card. Whenever this ETBs, mill three cards, return a land from our graveyard to the battlefield tapped, and activated abilities of all lands we control cost one less to activate. That means cards like Promising Vein, Myriad Landscape, Crows and Verge, all of these will cost less, and then land creatures get plus one, plus one, that one doesn't matter too much for us. But this is just a wonderful, wonderful ramp piece we needed access to. Also, Druid class gives us an additional land every turn, and it makes our lands give us one life, as long as we are at least at level two. Uh, Entish Restoration sacks a land and puts two basic lands from our battle uh, graveyard. Not, wow, I can't speak. I am so terribly sorry. Two basic lands from the deck onto the battlefield. However, if we have a creature with power four or greater, like our commander or even the plant tokens he makes, then he will instead give us three basic lands instead of two. Road to Ruin is a wonderful dual-faced card that lets us search our library for a basic land and put it on the battlefield tapped at instant speed. And then if, with its aftermath, we can blow up any creature with uh, damage equal to the number of lands we control. This card in a budget deck is fantastic because it serves two purposes. And then we have Spelunking. When it enters the battlefield, we draw a card and then place a land from our hand onto the battlefield tapped. And if we have a cave that we threw onto the battlefield, we gain four life. Not really relevant in this deck. And lands we control enter the battlefield untapped. That is relevant in our deck. In the recursion section, we have Redemption Choir and Emiria Shepherd. These are the new additions in. Emiria Shepherd says anytime a land enters the battlefield, take any non-land uh, card from our graveyard, permanent card, and put it into our hand. But if we play a planes, we can place that non-land permanent onto the battlefield instead without paying any mana costs. This is the recursion angel the deck wanted. 
Next, we have Redemption Choir. This is basically a four mana Sun Titan as long as we fulfill the requirement of Coven, having three different powers among our creatures. Easy to do with the tokens the deck makes. This is a wonderful recurrable way to get lands and anything else mana value three or less on the graveyard over and over again. Then in the removal section, we are adding in a return to nature that blows up an artifact, enchantment, or exiles a card at instant speed from a graveyard. So turn off, turning off the reanimator player if we need. And then we have generous gift and beast within two types of omni removal that give a token in exchange for blowing up your favorite thing. Then in the token section, we are going to be adding in Phylath World Sculptor. Uh, ETB gives us a 01 green plant token for every basic land we control. And then every time a land enters the battlefield under our control, put four 1-1 uh, counters on a plant we control. It's very easy for our deck to get basic lands onto the battlefield. So this is going to do a decent bit of work in any landfall deck. And those 01 plants will benefit from other stuff that is in the deck, like Avenger of Zendikar car even though this isn't going to be getting as many plant tokens on the battlefield as cards like avenger it will still give us about four to six anytime it drops down in a standard game then we have Maja, Bredegard Protector. Other creatures we control get 1-1, one, one, and every time any land enters the battlefield, we make a 1-1 one, one white human creature token. And then we have Felidar Retreat. Whenever a land enters the battlefield under our control, choose one, make a 2-2 two, two white cat beast creature token, or put a 1-1 one, one counter on each creature we control and give those creatures vigilance until end of turn. Basically a way to force a win con to happen if we need to just break parity. <laughs> Now that all of that is done, let's go ahead and see where we are at. We went ahead and made a ton of additions to the deck, and all this will be available as a link in the description below on Moxfield. 27 additions to the deck, and for every card that was cut, we dropped a couple of basic lands on top of everything else, which might have a little counter synergy with Phylath, but again, in my experience with landfall decks, it's easy to get a ton of basics on the board more than anything else. So now we are sitting at two board wipes, one Desert Synergy card, 10 pieces of draw and advantage, and the ones we are using are a lot stronger this time around. We have four methods of getting lands from the graveyard, and instead of getting lands to the graveyard with uh, milling effects, we are focusing on our commander's ability and also sack effects from other cards. We have 14 pieces of ramp now with some streamlined pieces like the Entus Restoration and the Blossoming Tortoise. The recursion section is much stronger now with a higher emphasis on using the Landfall recursion and also getting lands from our graveyard with cards like Redemption Choir and Sun Titan. Our removal package had an addition of one extra card, but otherwise it has a lot more options with the addition of the Generous Gift and the Beast within respectively. And our token creation is much stronger. Our low end of token creation is now stuff like Phylath, which can get us about, you know, four to five tokens when it comes out based on the basic lands, but it will power up plants in our deck otherwise with its ability. Titania, Omnath, uh, Scoot Swarm, and Avenger were all kept with Felidar Retreat and Maja giving us ways to lord power on our tokens and create tokens both in the same package. And we are keeping Rumbleweed as a surprise I win card. We went down to having four basic mountains, four basic plains, and six forests. We went up to 20 deserts. We swapped out one of the dual lands with one that can be searched with our Crows and Verge, and we doubled the amount of lands in our deck that could fetch other lands out of our deck so that we could make better use of the land fetching mechanic in our deck, make better use of land falling, make better use of lands to graveyard effects. This is something we needed to increase the thickness of in the deck no matter what, and we went down to a single command tower for the deck itself. That's where we are at at the moment, but let's say that you wanted to go ahead and upgrade the deck a little bit further. How would you go about doing that? Well, let's say that you weren't running with a strictly $20 upgrade budget, and you were instead trying to throw anything that you wanted into the deck at all. Well, I would suggest a couple cards. First of all, Conduit of Worlds lets you play any land you want from the graveyard and lets you cast cards from the grave on your own turn but only it locks you out of every other cast but it does give you a very easy access to that 
I would also add in an Elvish Reclaimer. Gets two, two as long as there are three or more lands in your grave, but it lets us sack a land to take any uh, land from our library and put on the battlefield tapped. This basically gives us Desert Searching, which is great. Dryad of the Elysian Grove is a better version of a Chromatic Lantern for us because this also lets us play additional lands. Speaking of additional lands, I would add Azusa Lost But Seeking, and since our deck has such a high density of lands to begin with, a Cultivator Colossus would certainly go very well here. And as my sixth card that I would add with no budgetary restrictions, it's a three mana color deck, so of course we want a searchable Triome. Our Crozen Verge can grab this, and it is a fantastic way to get ahead on mana better than running the tri land that comes in the land you know with the base deck itself <laughs> In conclusion, what we've mainly done is streamlined the various ways to trigger our commander's abilities. We lost ways of engaging in self-mill that sometimes throws lands into the graveyard, but increased the density of cards that throw themselves into the graveyard as lands. We've put streamlined board wipes in the deck. We've made the deck the same type of thing, but we have streamlined with a little better card selection what cards we are using for that. This will ultimately give you a deck that wants to spawn tokens with the commander, wants to get more deserts into the graveyard than it originally could, and will draw cards much faster, and will actually treat Yuma Proud Protector as the central part of the deck it should be, instead of just kind of a suggestion. The way the deck was originally built, it seemed to dirtle a lot more, so this version of the deck is going to be a little bit faster at getting its game plan online. Ultimately, we ended up spending about $19.24 in total with all of the additions that we added to the deck, and that does end up meaning that we dropped, what, $10 of value out of the deck and added $20, so the cost of the deck is a little higher than it originally was with the upgrades, but that's kind of to be expected. You spend $40 on a precon, you spend half of that price upgrading the precon to get it a little more smooth, and we'll see where you are at. If you bought this precon, let me know how it ran for you in the comment section below. Let me know what your local meta's like and how it responded to it. If you end up doing this deck upgrade, then please come back to the video and let me know your thoughts on how certain cards function and how you would like these videos to be done in the future. This is only my second time doing a deck upgrade video for the precons, and I don't know how everybody is enjoying them too much. I know when I did the Gaunti precon upgrade, uh, there was some pushback because of the direction I took him in, because I basically treated him as a let's go ahead and ram everybody with all the low-cost creatures possible commander. Not everybody's really here for that, but that's how I built my full power one, so that's how I was going to go with the deck upgrade. But let me know what you guys think in the comment section below. Hit the like button if you haven't already. Subscribe if you haven't already. We are almost to 4,000 subscribers, so thank you everybody that's gotten us there. I appreciate every single one of you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for watching the video. And as always, everyone, insert end of video tagline here. Hey, I just quickly want to give a thank you to all of my wonderful patrons who keep this show running. YouTube and Twitch are a pretty bumpy ride at the best of times, and the stability a Patreon provides me is worth more than I can say here. I'd also like to thank each and every one of my $20 and up patrons here. And they would be Red Joker, Britzkrieg, Cameron, Dren, Gemshin, Smiling DM, Poundini, Nabity Babity, Naomi, Isaac, Agamotto, Jordan, Ravi, Juni, Kiratorian, Prisma, all of you, Sagitta, I'm not saying that part, and Starlight. And finally, thank you to everyone else that helps keep this channel alive. While you're here, why not check out another video? And thank you for watching.